And this is going to be a conversation about user agency in democratic data. Um, I think that most people can agree that our digital platforms should not be controlling our lives, but when we talk about um, what could be alternatives to the platforms that we have today, then there are many misalignments. So, for instance, some, some people want more user agency and individual control of data. Others see almost all data as shared and interpersonal. And so in this panel, we're going to discuss these new paradigms and what are some of the conflicts between different approaches uh, for data governance and uh, data ownership. So our moderator is Alek Tarkovsky. Um, Dr. Alek Tarkovsky is a digital activist, strategist, and sociologist of technology. He's a co-founder and strategy director of the Open Future Think Tank. And he also... Um, sits at the board of, direct, of directors of Creative Commons and chairs the oversight board of the Centrum Cyfrawi, a Polish digital think and do think. Did I pronounce that correctly? Okay, more or less. Um, he was strategic had a strategic advisory role in the Polish office of the Prime Minister, and he was a member of the European Commission expert group on AI and data in education. Alex's work uh, focuses on strategies and public policies through which digital technologies are shaped to maximize public benefit. So, Alex, thank you so much for moderating this panel, and I'll hand it over to you. Uh, thanks, and uh, f my first thought is that I should now make uh, as extensive introductions of our guests, but that would require me to go into improvisation and freestyle, so I won't do that. I actually had a different plan. Um, the way we'll run this session is that I'll make a short setting of the scene, and then uh, each of uh, the speakers will have a chance to speak, which gives them a very nice opportunity to highlight those aspects of their work and themselves, which they want to share. And I actually think also your ideas here are more interesting than um, the bios, which are, of course, also relevant. Um, so what I like about this event today is that it, it sort of weaves around this theme of uh, democracy and pluralism. A lot of ideas that are interesting for me and are also key for our societies. And data, which is the topic of this session, is one of them. Now, maybe we will vary in this room how exciting it is. Probably everyone will agree that the art sessions are super cool. I don't know how many in the room think data is super cool, but I think the panelists do. And that's why I'm happy to have this conversation with uh, Katarzyna Szymielewicz from Panopticon Foundation, Joanna Gutkowska from uh, Golem Foundation and Wildland IO, and Sile Sepp from My Data Foundation as well. Yes. Um, what we want to discuss today is sort of data governance in the shadow of the great commercial platforms because I hope that's actually something we all agree here in this room that, that, that we're having this conversation in a very particular time when our data is being held, extracted, exploited, some will even say, by great um, companies which, which control our data and therefore sort of control our lives, because maybe that's another important assumption to make here, especially that we'll be talking about users. Users in today's reality are flesh and blood people, but they're also some kind of a cloud of data, collection of data, catalog of data, you name it, uh, which represents them, which connects with them. So when we talk about data governance, this is today very personal, right? It's not just about how do we govern it's also relevant debates about, let's say, industrial data, um, non-personal data, but it's also a lot about just us represented by data, being data. So we want to talk today about uh, alternatives, and I think uh, with, with the discussing these alternatives, we're sort of in a place which Matt described earlier talking about Spain. Uh, the, I don't know if this is a good analogy or not. I'm always anxious about... Uh, with analogies that regard war and the military, but we sort of live in a time when we need to make them. But, but when you talked about this, these uh, divisions uh, within a movement that can be very hard, 
that's sometimes how, how debates among progressive data governance activists feels like we really have our pet projects, pet approaches, pet challenges. Uh, what I hope we can do today a bit is explore these uh, various takes. Uh, I know that the three of you are interested in different approaches to alternative data governance. You have different ideas of what really counts. You know, if, if you follow these debates, some people really care about sovereignty. Some people want to talk about monetization, seeing it as a fair way to reward people. Uh, other wants to really still focus on protections and something protection of data is a lost cause and we need to move forward and maybe talk about things like access or availability of data. So I hope we can explore a bit, bit these approaches and maybe even uh, look at some tensions uh, or maybe positive um, connections. And one question I'll surely raise because we have this starting point of platforms. Um, there's someone here from a wonderful uh, Czech institution called Parallelni Polis, and that's a wonderful theoretical idea uh, created by Václav Benda, Czech um, uh, communist era um, progressive thinker who said, that if it's impossible to change the dominant system, you build a parallel policy, a parallel alternative, somewhere hiding on the margins in the different cracks. It's a very beautiful idea, um, and, but one which assumes that you really cannot change the system. And this is something I will also want to explore during the session. Are we talking about really alternatives as in, you know, uh, weird new spaces somewhere in the margins, autonomous zones, and so on, uh, or really the prerequisite step is somehow to change this dominant situation and do something with platforms. Uh, I know this is something you also think about. But okay, let's maybe uh, start. Um, I would like each of you to sort of talk a bit about your perspective. What's your take on data governance? What are you experimenting with, working on, paying attention to? And maybe we'll start with you, Silla. Can you hear me? Yes? Uh, good. So hi everyone, um, I'm Sila. Uh, as I already mentioned, I work uh, in the um, organization called My Data Global, which is a non-profit um, organization. We work internationally and uh, advocate for the topic of human-centric approach to personal data. We do that by uh, then bringing uh, a very broad network of stakeholders to uh, an network of stakeholders to together to really let's say build the scene the set uh, and also the solutions and the backstage to empower individuals with their data um, so we don't necessarily directly uh, provide those services to to individuals as uh, from our end but uh, what is important for us is uh, is that when we look at those solutions we uh, really want to bring um, bring those uh, mainly four different perspectives uh, together. We talk about uh, the business perspective, the business models, economics, all of that uh, angle, the legal and governance issues, of course the technology that needs to underpin all of those different solutions, and then also what we importantly want to look at is the societal implications that all of this then has. So we really look at the, uh, all of those uh, pillars um, that uh, we don't only uh, start to um, think that one, let's say, perspective would uh, be the savior of, of these challenges. Um, so uh, when we look at the data governance, um, I think uh, what, uh, yeah, if I rec reflect back, for me, it seems that uh, we're, this topic of data governance is uh, um, getting traction beyond the usual suspects, first of all. Um, and it's really great to see that um, the discussion is also going from the mere need to protect data to actually a more nuanced way of also how do we use data um, and uh, still keep the, the agency for individuals and, and groups. And uh, in our context, um, um, the, we really want to see this as a both and discussion. So it's not only about uh, the need for, um, or the, the viewpoint for individuals and, and groups that they have the right for privacy and hence they need to protect and maybe even constrain the use of data, but actually also an inherent right to benefit uh, from that data. So um, also when we take a, a more broader uh, or bigger picture of how society is organized or economy is organized, people are all, uh, often described as, as users or consumers. Um, and, um, and this is a very organization-centric uh, organization uh, view to describe people. Um, from our perspective, especially when we look at the personal data, we want to see actually that 
I know I want to influence how we could start looking at data actually from the perspective of individuals and communities interest, their expectations, their really meaning of how to purposefully uh, use that data then. So um, to bring all of this a little bit also more concrete, uh, we work in My Data Global um, in a very, uh, also with different um, intermediary models and, and governance models uh, because um, the data management and data sharing is very complex uh, topic. It's also very complex in terms of management and sharing how, how this sh should happen. Um, across organizations and we believe and, and see that some sort of assistance or support is needed uh, for individuals and in that my data model then what we've uh, looked at um, there is a role for operators um, or data intermediation services uh, as it's now called in the data governance act and we see those intermediary services as enablers one like one of its enablers of really protecting uh, the data and making consent, for example, more actionable. But at the, uh, on the other hand, it's also actually an enabler for value creation because those in, um, intermediaries can help with um, matchmaking different service providers so that actually the possibility to create new innovative services uh, starts to yeah, arise. And, and those operators or data intermediation services are, are not nothing new or conceptual only. they are um, been existing in the market already for, for many, many years. And um, again, in the context of our work, uh, we've um, uh, run um, a operator award process for now three years. And in total, already 41 service providers uh, have also received that award. So from that work that we really do on the ground from bottom up to understand how those uh, different governance models and services are, are, are um, implemented, we see that those are very, very different uh, service providers, but uh, they have also some similar or, or core functionalities that they, um, that they offer. And what is interesting for us is actually to start seeing how then based on those uh, functionalities, uh, we start to also move towards interoperability between those intermediation services because inter interoperability helps to open up um, those ecosystems, those uh, um, collaborations and, and bring right away more freedom of choice, uh, both for individuals as well as organizations, how they uh, yeah, exchange data. So maybe just to wrap up, uh, I, I see that it's already going quite long from, from my end. If I need to point out maybe three main points that we are looking towards in terms of data, but also data governance, is that um, um, those three shifts that uh, are described in the MyData Declaration, moving from just formal uh, rights to actionable rights. This is when I talk about really having those enablers that help to bring those, all of those solutions to very convenient ways of exercising those rights. Then the second uh, shift is actually moving from just uh, protecting data to actually empowering individuals and communities with their data. Um, and then finally, actually uh, moving from closed to, to open ecosystems. And here I talk about this freedom of choice, level playing field, all of those uh, uh, different angles that are uh, necessary for uh, data governance. So yeah, I'll, I'll stop here and I'm looking forward to the uh, discussion. I have one quick question. Um, because you have a good sort of view of, of this field of data intermediation. I think part of the challenge of discussing this, these things is that data can be almost anything. So in terms of trends, is there some dominant uh, focus that these intermediaries take th that you can highlight? You know, like w what specifically, for instance, the type of data that they intermediate or an approach that they have? So first of all, like um, how we see intermediation services is that they provide the infrastructure and then they're like I mentioned those different functionalities that uh, they might focus on permission management, identity management, maybe they also do service management, actually provide personal data stores or, or only actually um, so, uh, support with this exchange. So these are the, the different types of um, uh, functionalities and they're a total of, of nine. Um, the use cases are very different. Okay. Um, so they go from basically looking at how um, 
yeah, data from um, advertisement uh, could be brought back to the individual stores and so that they can actually ask, share this further or they go actually into very uh, specific domains like health or like, uh, I don't know, skills or uh, smart cities, etc. So they still have those very different uh, use cases. And of course, the intention is that uh, um, the, um, uh, the use cases grow into actually more cross-sectoral data sharing because that's where the, uh, value is uh, um, created um, and the value of data actually increases. Just to mention also what is uh, important, I think, in terms of the intermediation services is that it needs to be financially sustainable also for them. We look at the intermediation services mainly from um, individuals, uh, intermediaries for individuals. So they need uh, individuals and then people need to be the primary beneficiaries for that, for them, but still, intermediation services are also private uh, organizations or, or companies that need to be able to provide that services so they cannot be seen only as as um, uh, yeah uh, with the role of, of uh, public uh, uh, how you call it um, representation uh, that for example public sector has and this said again I just want to mention that intermediation is so nuanced again it can be a non-profit it can be a collaborative it actually can be a, a private company that provides that service so there are very different ways of uh, organizing this and also still intermediation there are others that facilitate mainly uh, intermediation between different ecosystems different organizations and we look at primarily for uh, intermediation services that are focused on the individuals okay Sorry, thanks so, so that's a broad view, and this is maybe a good moment to shift to you, Joanna, because you in turn are building your own specific solutions. So I'm very yeah, curious I, about your focus take. Yeah, I just to... Does it work now? Yeah. So uh, you touched on one on one topic: uh, the empowering, about empowering user with the data, and you gave some typical examples like healthcare and smart cities. Can you, can you name some more? How to empower a user with access to their data? In terms of uh, domains where they're like exercising? Is, is it like, you know, empowering, empowering users with access to data as a, as a goal? Can you give some examples other than healthcare or smart cities? There are varied ones in terms of, like I mentioned already, uh, really retail, for example. There like are case retail. retail. How, how? And there is uh, different types of media. Uh, does it really empower data. the users? Or does it empower the uh, the sellers? In terms of uh, the the view, of what we see in, ter um, in terms of empowering individuals is that they get practical tools to understand what data is even. Like, um, gathered, how it's collected, how it's governed, how to also actually get use of sharing this data further. And so you're saying it empowers me in terms of me understanding how I'm being controlled to buy more stuff. Not necessarily, because uh, there, of course, there's uh, that goes mm -hmm. into the the governance and the legislation as a whole. What are also the different data rights, and what I mentioned about this kind of formal to actionable rights that we uh, work towards is that it it cannot be that complicated to just that 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 it's. Um, granted with legislation but that there are also practical tools for um that with services that for individuals and communities to get access to that data and potentially then also move it further to other stakeholders but, but do what with this data can i okay i'm, I'm asking those questions want, mm -hmm. because i have an important point to make mm -hmm. uh hopefully as becoming clear that data itself is boring i mean data itself is it's, it's a buzzword these days but Really, I don't really care much about data. What I really care about myself as a as a um, thinking person is information. Uh, information is structured data. It's data that is well somehow uh, like a like a book, like a story, like a drawing, like a blueprint, like uh, a theory. This information. What I'm really after is the information that is really. Um, 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 digested by my brain, by my mind, which is called knowledge. And I'm really for the knowledge because the knowledge for me is one of the top goals uh, 
apart from other goals like maybe beauty and love, knowledge is a goal worth pursuing. Um, so now, once you start thinking about how we as individuals go through our lives and, <clears throat> and we acquire our history and some knowledge, uh, some tastes, some likes, uh, this all is kind of like a, like a large, like uh, large uh, pieces of information. Um, and now, if we look at how do we go in, how we interact with information today, as we interacted through different kinds of apps and services, um, and it turns out that all those apps and services are guardians to the information that makes us us. If you sign up to the theory that my I, myself, my consciousness, is really a stream of information, then we are moving increasingly towards a situation where information that makes me is spread among third parties. For example, I'm using uh, a few very, very cool applications uh, for uh, knowledge management. One is Bear for, for organizing my, my notes. Another is Muse for spatial uh, thinking and also organization of information. But other people use some others, like artists might be using Procreate or Photoshop. Uh, others might be using editors. And all this information is super important to me. But I am forced I'm forced to accept that the information that I'm producing, for example, for several years I've been creating a very vast note system about my life, about knowledge I'm learning, and I'm being forced to have this knowledge system stored on iCloud Drive just because bare app that I'm using as primary organization, organ, organ, organizer of my knowledge just forces me to using Apple iCloud Drive. I'm using also Remarkable for thinking, and I'm actually forced to use Remarkable cloud service, which comes with Remarkable, which actually uses, uh, uh, I think, Google Cloud Platform uh, these days. And really, if Remarkable decides to cut me off, I'm lost, I have, like hundreds of my notes is, is lost. And now, notice the difference between like a, a note, like a visual uh, creation that I just made, which is a reflection of my thoughts, and of myself, the value of this kind of data, uh, which is super important, and I think on a different level than data about like how many steps I did yesterday when I was going to work. This data, like this, this low level data is like, well, it's good to have some control of it. Well, of course, it's good that it's not being leaked to, uh, I don't know, uh, third parties, so I'm not being bombard, bombarded with all kinds of advertising for new uh, sneakers, whatever. But it's really, 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 really on a different league of, infor of importance than the information that I have produced and is important for my life, like my notes, like my photos, like my uh, whatever other uh, um, creations of my, of my mind. And so, uh, going to explaining what, what I'm uh, doing professionally uh, at Gone Foundation, we, we are working on Wideland, which is, which hopes to be an infrastructure for both organization and storage of your information on your own terms. And I can tell more uh, in the next iteration. Okay. Thanks. Um, sounds like uh, some connection points with things that we talk a lot, so I know are important for you. So what's your story, Kasia? And where's your microphone? Here it is, yeah. okay. Okay, uh, waiting for the microphone, maybe. Maybe this one. Um, thank you. I, I have the privilege of, of talking first, so I can, I can relate to, to problems that were sketched both uh, by Sile and, and Joanna. My background is in law. Uh, I, I represent Panopticon Foundation, but also for, for quite a long time, I've been uh, on the board of the whole coalition we have across uh, Europe with an um, office in Brussels called European uh, Digital Rights. And as digital rights defenders, that's how we frame ourselves. And 
lawyers slash geeks, we have both in the network, we've been preoccupied with trying to answer to the challenges of hosting, controlling the data, or as you prefer to call it, information, structured information about humans, but even more so, we've been concerned about protecting these humans from getting manipulated, surveilled, trapped in profiling, and then uh, content curation that controls their lives by the, the, the third parties that track them, or the first parties, the service providers, because both roles are problematic or have been problematic throughout the time we observed, which is last 20 years. So for us, the milestones in these battles have been uh, GDPR, which is the upgrade of very, very old data protection regulation. I still think is a useful legal framework. I do not think that GDPR is to blame for the cancer of internet, which is the, the bloody pop-ups and all the hell of tracking. The idea behind that law was to eliminate that all. It's a separate conversation why the framework failed, but the failure is the market failure and the execution failure, not a legal uh, framework failure. Uh, but okay, the time uh, is, we are moving on. We notice the difference between data controlled by different entities and our power to move that data, to port it to different places, to control in a sense that I, I can go to Facebook and correct the input data I give to Facebook, I can do that. But we all know it's not going to change anything really because the power of the data evolved with the time, with the development of, of AI models, machine learning, statistical methods, all that that does not really fit on personal data in the sense that GDPR uh, acknowledges. So the observations that algorithms across the board are able to are designed to, to, to detect about humans, that knowledge about human beings and the trends they follow, the, the behavior, the mental patterns, does not have to be personal. And from that perspective, this is another battle to control who controls the knowledge rather than who control who stores my data on which server and whether the ser server is secure or whether I prefer to have it under my desk. I can move my personal data, the ones I generate, wherever I want. Obviously, it's really good to have independent places. From that perspective, I uh, respect and admire both projects that you ladies described. But from my perspective, somebody defending humans against surveillance and manipulation, this is not enough because what, I, what is my challenge is to cut the tracking and the observation that happens beyond my production of data. It happens through CCTV, it happens through sensors, it happens in the traffic, uh, I mean like city traffic, it happens on airports and it happens online, but it is based on behavior observation, which is something I can't control even if I have a personal data pod and a sharing model and a cloud of my choice and all that. So how to approach this problem? Uh, we came up with this concept that I think is already present in the debate for a while, but we've been evolving with this, which is unbundling large platforms. Why do we look at large platforms like Google, Amazon, Facebook? Not because we like them so much that we want them to stay. We just acknowledge the fact that most of the surveilled individuals across the globe, including uh, wealthy Europe, will stay there. It might be, you know, renamed something else. I'm pretty sure that Facebook uh, <laughs> will cease to exist uh, sooner than we regulate them. But, you know, some, something else of the same, with the same business model, which is exploitation, manipulation, control over behavioral data in order to create profit, uh, will continue. So we need to address them. And our concept in, in the network is, is the following. Let's Let's give them the, ho the, the hosting of the data if people like, if people want to host data on something else, on another server, even better. Uh, but let's unbundle the layers. So even if people choose to host their pictures on, on, on um, WhatsApp or whatever, like Instagram, okay. That's not so problematic from our perspective as the interface that they have to use in order to communicate with the rest of the world. 
the interface is uh, the key factor in the power game, right? Because this is the interface that makes me addicted, that encourages me to share more than I want, that um, uh, creates uh, certain power asymmetries or or issues like um, um, like 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 people engaging with the content that harms them because you know the content that is harmful is actually visible uh, more uh, and suggested more frequently than the informative quality content. We all know that. So so the interface, the algorithm, and the commercial layer on the top of everything, which is advertising, uh, needs to be unbundled, and then we can discuss on each layer different models of empowerment with hosting i fully agree personal data pod or another place where i control my data very good idea but the behavior observation not solved so the interface where the behavior observation happens that interface layer also needs to be um, open for empowerment and here we suggest that independent providers come to something like Facebook or YouTube with their own algorithm that it has not do all these evil things and with the advertising I respect the fact that some people will not be able or, or willing to pay for the content for access to content or social networks fair enough but they can still opt for advertising model that works like Netflix where you identify categories that you are okay with uh, instead of being tracked and manipulated by third party doing um, you know cross-site tracking so in short this is the kind of solution we are seeking and discussing now uh, on Brussels level there are interesting legislative openings including data act that would definitely give space for things like wideland wideland and 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 my data org uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you follow that so you know it's it's interesting time because many things that happen in Brussels exactly respond to problems you both described not yet go as far as I would like this to go there is no unbundling mandated yet but well the battle is not finished Jana what do you think about this blueprint uh, or this uh, idea of an ecosystem yeah of course uh, enforcing platforms to expose public APIs interface you're talking about is, is absolutely uh, uh, an idea we should be pursuing and, and regulating that's that's for sure but let's assume we have solved that um, five years from now every every big platform has an API I can have access to my uh, photos on messenger I don't use messenger but let's say I, I used uh, whatever now the real question is uh, that we humans uh, got used to being well, we are lazy creatures of course and we got used to being offered almost everything we should be consuming by by uh, third parties we don't think about what book we want to read we just expect Amazon or Goodreads to to give us a recommendation we expect Google to give us a recommendation for a restaurant nearby and and a movie to see etc so if we now uh, let, let me go back even with those interfaces, someone will have to do that. Someone, some program, some platform, maybe platforms. Uh, the question is how we envision this being done. Uh, do we want the future where we move this control? This again shows my different thinking, like me thinking about structured information versus thinking about low-level data, because low-level data uh, what Katarzyna said, problem solved with APIs, almost solved. Um, but when we go now to this higher level of what is data, it's in structured information, the question is who, who dictates us, who tells us, who recommends us, how to consume this whole universe of information that, that our world is made of? Who makes us what to read, what to watch, what to, what to think, where to go? Uh, so this is an important question. I know if we have time to elaborate it, maybe you uh, have some ideas. I just quickly answer, because maybe it wasn't clear that the answer, I tried to give it already. So in the model I described, you can choose your governor or your filter. You can even create it yourself. If you have capacity as a network like this one, you can probably design that filter. Sure. Uh, right. So there is no... Uh, Today, we don't have choice. We have one curator. The only problem is, I mean, th that sounds good. And it sounds appealing for a person like myself, who is a technical, who can program. But the, what I'm afraid of is that in order to, to write a good, say, a movie recommender or book recommender, you would need to be someone like Google or Facebook. 
you would need to have this kind of machinery running in the cloud, knowing all that they know about us today to be such a good recommender. And the, uh, what's the other option then? And he, here is my, my, my pitch, uh, Wideland pitch, uh, is uh, that give, this, give, the, give the tools to the user how to navigate among this complex informational universe. And this is what we do with Wideland and also Aleph 6, which is a sub-project of Wideland about unification of information. I yeah, just wanted to say that. Okay. I, I'll just jump in for a second. Uh, what I think I need to put into this conversation, especially that we have the word democratic data governance, is some form of community. Because, um, and even I must say with my data, I really like your model, but, um, and I think it's not your goal because I think you're just creating a broad framework, but among the intermediaries, I would like to see more who, who sort of try to drive this community approach. Um, it's also something that I find interesting in what I think of as the post GDPR conversation that we see some limits to this individual approach. A person stands up and says, hey, make my data portable, takes it out and knows what to do with it. At the same time, you know, it's easy to say community and some communities are easy to define. I think it's not surprising. We have a lot of discussions about um, basically Uber data because it's very easy to say who's the community of Uber drivers who could be also drivers aligned by a different platform. But also, you know, when you, I find fascinating the conversations happening in more cultural space where you find out that, for instance, musical genres, which always build communities, are now defined algorithmically, and the company like Spotify sometimes doesn't know what to call them. You know, there's this idea of scissor labels, right? That, that, that these names, it's no longer like punk, but really you come up with neologism because the algorithm shows you that these five bands create a culture. So I think there's something very hard about community and at the same something when I hear about alternative, about information and knowledge, I would like to build it not only myself, but some group of people, but which one I don't know. <laughs> and I want someone to tell me. Um, we have a bit more time. Uh, Sila, please go ahead. First of all, thank you for this discussion. It's, uh, it's really inspirational. And I think uh, we're not very far off actually with our viewpoints also because uh, um, I, presented in, uh, um, from my data side one angle uh, of, of work that we do uh, with the intermediation services. But of course, the, um, uh, around, the whole idea around my data and the human-centric approach to personal data was uh, the point that, that um, in, in the context of personal data, the, the viewpoint, if we start to look at it from the perspective of individuals and communities, then um, the, we, need, need, uh, we start to also see that we need different and alternative ways of organizing this. And that of how do we organize it is not only the job of intermediaries or it's not only the job of uh, legislators or, or different types of organizations, but it's a very multi-layered approach. Um, we need to look for, uh, you know, how to raise uh, in terms of data literacy, even to understand how data is embedded into our, you know, society. All of the, those different angles need to uh, become important. And I wanted to maybe point out one thing um, that actually started uh, building up in my, my head uh, based on the previous uh, session. I'm actually from Estonia, so it was very interested, uh, interesting to listen to interpretations of, uh, of Estonian case uh, uh, of the digi uh, digitalization. And one of the uh, statements that was made uh, was that it's, um, uh, many of the services are actually from top down. Um, of course, I haven't uh, built those myself, so I don't know the real um, uh, intention behind this, but what I can reflect back is that there's also the level of understanding that uh, um, we want to uh, make lives easier and we want to make a certain services seamless. And hence, it can start uh, to feel that something is provided to us, something is happening in the background, because then that allows us to live the life that we want to live and focus on other intentions. This said, this cannot go into a black box. It cannot be go into something that it, uh, things are organized on behalf of us only, um, so that there is also me mechanisms for taking collective action to uh, inquire information. So all of these aspects of transparency and accountability and, and, and so forth is important to keep in mind. And I believe that in, in the Estonian case, often it is um, as well. So the point is not about Estonia, but really the aspect that um, 
Um, I find that it's always a balancing act between different interests and the, uh, the balancing uh, act of also in terms of different mechanisms that we start to put in play so that we could actually start moving to a vision that we have jointly. Um, so we like in terms of legislations, we see now the, uh, a tsunami coming in, in Europe with uh, market sectors, uh, you know, data act, the data governance act. All of these try to cover different angles of it, but then it goes into actual uh, implementations of how this will put into um, into practice from from the organisations and company side. So like as you pointed out. In terms of, for example, the market's failure, how we avoid that there would be a market's failure now also with the, with the new tsunami that comes out in terms of legislation. I can make some, some uh, maybe unrelated remarks uh, still. Um, one thing I wanted to point out is that recommendations for movies, books, uh, restaurants is one thing. But remember that we are also thinking beings, meaning that we also sometimes want to learn something non-trivial. Imagine yourself going back to university and wanting to learn something as complex as um, uh, high, uh, high math, say a topology. How would you go about it? You would start doing probably notes, right? So I'm drawing some diagrams, uh, putting some notes. You would put it into some, some note-taking app like for example, I would recommend Muse, for example, it's a great app for that. Then this is part of you. But over, over the years, you would have such things like over and over again, if, if you are an intellectual worker. And this all would, would make you, and this is significantly more difficult to give a user a tool to navigate among those accumulated knowledge. Uh, than just write a recommender for a movie or a good book. I think this is clear. And you might think that, well, okay, but you are all like 30s, in your 30s, 40s, uh, and you never had to look back to your uh, school notes, I guess. Well, um, perhaps the fact that most of us are just sliding on this, on this little surface of understanding of knowledge doesn't mean that it wouldn't be nice to be able to actually have more understanding at your at your you know at your fingertips, uh, I would love this desire. I admit that when I was at school, I never actually made or almost never made notes because I thought I could remember and you know come up with an theorem just on the fly. Now I regret it, and now I when I'm learning uh, uh, new disciplines uh, or going back to learning math again, I'm actually making lots of notes, and this is super important to have tools that will allow future us to navigate amongst this. Because if we don't have such tools, if we all rely on something like Google, or maybe a third party recommender or, or answer your questions, you ask, what's the Gauss Bonnet theorem? And you get, oh, this, this theorem about whatever in topology. And then you, uh, and you, oh, by the way, and remember, this is, uh, relates to this graph theory and the Euler number. Ah, oh, okay, okay. And just forget about it in a moment. But then think about who actually does this thinking. Is it really you thinking? Is it really you understanding topology? Uh, or is it someone who gives you this answer, the Google? Or maybe it's some third party Google. Doesn't matter, it's not you. So I think that we are, we the humanity, we are at the danger of actually debraining ourselves and becoming just bodies executing uh, commands by, you know, whoever will be telling us what to think, what to enjoy, what to understand, what to answer. That's... Uh... I have this collective perspective, so I started thinking about Wikipedia. I, what you talk about, about people building this collective knowledge, I think you should talk with Wikipedians and they could do things better based on your... Wikipedia is thinking. an interesting example, but uh, have you ever had this moment of like, Oh, this is so fun and beautiful read reading Wikipedia. Would you? No. <laughs> Wikipedia is meh. It's, it's like boring. It's it's also too in depth, too detailed. Like I almost never can learn a complex concept by reading his Wikipedia article. I can learn difficult concepts by reading uh, a textbook or the doing sources, maths. Fortunately, like in Wikipedia. But my, my point is Wikipedia because it is a collective work. 
it's neither fun nor beautiful nor engaging. So I just don't believe collective mind would be happy if it ever existed. So we got quite far from data. It reminds me of a quote from a Frank Zappa song where there's like information is not knowledge, knowledge is not wisdom and so on. And we talked about all of this, which I'm actually quite happy we did. I also think we only just started. Maybe if anyone wants to talk about user agency and democratic data governance, but also knowledge and wisdom over lunch, uh, I'm happy to do that. And for now, thank you uh, to my great uh, co-speakers in this session.